uh, a book, American Fascists, and another one, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. Um, this book is his most recent book. It's just been published, America, The Farewell Tour. And we do have some copies over here for sale after the, sir, after the uh, presentation, and Chris will sign them. Ha Welcome back. I uh, gave a talk here about 10 years ago, well, more maybe, on War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, and this is where I met my wife in this room. <laughs> she was uh, starring in Antigone. She's an actor. She's just started a play, rehearsals today, for a play written by Daniel Berrigan, uh, The Catonsville Nine, which some, amazingly 30 years ago was on Broadway. Um, it's be I've read it. It's gorgeous. Uh, Berrigan was not only a great activist, but a really great writer and a great poet um, and baptized uh, our youngest daughter, held her in his arms uh, while he spoke about marching in Selma with uh, Martin Luther King. And then when he finished, uh, said everyone in the room uh, has to wish equality for this child and I'm going to begin and I wish for a sense of humor. Um, since I know there are people here who are religiously and theologically literate, uh, I just finished reading James Cones's memoir. He died in April. Um, our greatest contemporary theologian, uh, without question, um, said I wasn't going to tell nobody. Uh, and I'm, we were close friends. I spoke at his funeral at Riverside. Um, but I'm just a huge admirer of his courage, his integrity, and his brilliance. Um, I wrote a column. I write a column every week for Truth Dig, uh, the website run by Bob Shear out of L.A., and so I wrote a column. If you want to get a sense of the book, I wrote a column on the book um, that will come out uh, tomorrow. I think they actually put it out late tonight, but it will be out tomorrow. Yeah, he's an amazing man, isn't he? Um, I remember we were walking together down uh, Broadway past Columbia University and he looked, James looked over and said, all those brilliant minds and almost all of them are irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very true. The French sociologist Emile Durkheim, in his book On Suicide, examined the disintegration of social bonds that drive individuals and societies to personal and collective acts of self-destruction. He found that when social bonds are strong, individuals achieve a healthy balance between individual initiative, self-actualization, and communal solidarity, which he called a life-sustaining equilibrium. These individuals and communities, he found, have the lowest rates of suicide. The individuals and societies most susceptible to self-destruction, he wrote, are those for, her, for, those for whom these social bonds, this equilibrium, have been shattered. Societies are held together by a web of social bonds that give individuals a sense of being part of a collective and engaged in a project larger than the self. This collective expresses itself through meaningful work, democratic participation, worship and values and even patriotism and shared national beliefs. The bonds provide meaning, a sense of purpose, status, and dignity. They offer psychological protection from impending mortality and meaninglessness that comes with being isolated and rejected. The disintegration of these bonds 
plunges individuals into deep psychological distress that leads ultimately to acts of self-annihilation. Durkheim called this state of hopelessness and despair anomie, which he defined as rulelessness. Rulelessness means the norms that govern a society and create a sense of organic solidarity no longer function. The belief, for example, that if we work hard, obey the law, and get a good education, we can achieve stable employment, social status, and mobility, along with financial security, is no longer true. The old rules that were imperfect and often excluded poor people of color, nevertheless were not a complete fiction in the United States. They offered some Americans, especially those from the white working and middle class, modest social and economic advancement. But the capture of political and economic power by corporate elites, along with the redirecting of all institutions toward the further consolidation of their power and wealth, has broken the social bonds that held the American society together. This rupture has unleashed a widespread malaise and self-destructiveness Durkheim would have recognized. When society is strongly integrated, he wrote, it keeps individuals in a state of dependency, holding them to be in its service and consequently not permitting them to dispose of themselves as they wish. Society is thus opposed to them escaping from their obligations towards it through death. The bond that attaches them to their common purpose attaches them to life. And in any case, the high goal towards which their gaze is turned alleviates the suffering that they feel from life's troubles. Finally, in a coherent and vital community, there is a continual exchange of ideas and feelings from all to each and from each to all, which is like mutual moral support so that the individual, instead of being reduced to his or her resources only, participates in the collective energy and draws on it when his or hers is exhausted. Our corporate coup d'etat and our failed democracy has freed the oligarchs from all legal and moral constraints. The state of disorganization or anomie is thus reinforced by the fact that Passions are less disciplined at a time when they need stronger discipline, Durkheim noted, of the avarice of the rich. It is not for nothing that so many religions have celebrated the benefits and the moral value of poverty, Durkheim wrote. This is because of all schools. It is the one that best teaches humankind to restrain itself. By obliging us to exercise constant discipline over ourselves, it prepares us to accept collective discipline with docility, while wealth, by exalting the individual, constantly risks awakening the spirit of rebellion that is the very font of immortality. Professor Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page in their study of legislative laws wrote, the central point that emerges from our research is that the economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on US government policy, while mass-based interest groups and average citizens have little or no independent influence. In essence, the electoral process is a facade, one where we choose between the friendly and inclusive form of corporate fascism, 
under the Democratic Party of the raw, racist, Christian fascism of Donald Trump's white man's party. The economic structures, like the political structures, have been reconfigured to keep the working class in a state of constant distress. American productivity, as the New York Times pointed out, has increased 77% since 1973, but hourly pay has grown by only 12%. If the federal minimum wage was attached to productivity, it would be more than $20 an hour, not $7.25 an hour. Some 41.7 million workers, a third of the U.S. workforce, earn less than $12 an hour. And most of them do not have access to employer-sponsored health insurance. A decade after the 2008 financial meltdown, the Times noted, the average middle-class family's net worth is more than $40,000 below what it was in 2007, and the net worth of black families has declined by 40%, and for Latino families, this figure has dropped by 46%. The financial crisis of 2008 saw the world's central banks, including the Federal Reserve, inject trillions of dollars of fabricated money into the global financial system. The Federal Reserve, which is supposed to regulate banks alone, handed over an estimated $29 trillion of fabricated money to American banks, according to researchers at the University of Missouri. $29 trillion. Kevin Sees and Margaret Flowers from Popular Resistance wrote, one sixth of this could provide a $12,000 annual basic income, which would cost 3.8 trillion annually, doubling social security payments to $22,000 annually would cost $662 billion. And a $10,000 bonus for all US public school teachers would cost $11 billion. Free college for all high school graduates would cost $318 billion. And universal preschool would cost $38 billion. National improved Medicare for all would actually save the nation trillions of dollars over a decade. The Fed and other central banks cut interest rates to near zero, and some central banks in Europe instituted negative interest rates, meaning they would pay borrowers to take loans. The Fed, in a clever bit of accounting, even permitted distressed banks to use these no interest loans to buy U.S. Treasury bonds. The banks gave the bonds back to the Fed and received a quarter of a percent interest from the Fed. In short, the banks were loaned money at virtually no interest by the Fed and then were paid interest by the Fed on the money they borrowed. The Fed also bought up worthless derivatives and other toxic assets from the banks and since federal authorities could fabricate as much money as they wanted, it did not matter if what they were buying was worthless. This fabricated money has created a worldwide debt of $325 trillion, more than three times global GDP. The fabricated money was hoarded by banks and corporations, loaned by banks at predatory interest rates, used to service interest on often unsustainable debt, or spent buying back stock, providing billions in compensation for the ruling elites. The fabricated money was not provided to the victims of financial fraud, but the victimizers. It was not invested in the real economy. Products were not manufactured and sold. Workers were not reinstated into the middle class with sustainable incomes, benefits, and pensions. Infrastructure projects were not undertaken. 
The fabricated money reinflated massive financial bubbles built on debt and papered over a fatally diseased financial system destined for collapse. The criminal irresponsibility of these elites was simply perpetrated again on an even more massive scale. What will trigger the next crash? The $13.2 trillion in unsustainable U.S. household debt? The $1.5 trillion in student debt? The billions Wall Street has invested in the fracking industry that has spent $280 billion more than it generates from its profits? Who knows? What is certain is that a global financial crash, one that may dwarf the meltdown of 2008, is inevitable. And this time, with interest rates near zero, the elites have no plan B. The financial structure will disintegrate. The global economy will go into a death spiral. The rage of a betrayed and impoverished population will, I fear, further empower right-wing demagogues who promise vengeance on the global elites, moral renewal, and a nativist revival, heralding a return to a mythical time when immigrants, women, and people of color knew their place, and in the United States, a Christianized fascism. Given the staggering amount of fabricated money that has to be repaid. The banks need to build greater and greater pools of debt. This is why when you are late in paying your credit card, the interest rate jumps to 28%. This is why if you declare bankruptcy, you are still responsible for paying off your student loan, even as one million people a year default on student loans, with 40% of all borrowers expected to default on student loans by 2023. This all comes from the New York Times, by the way. This is why wages are stagnant or have declined, while costs from healthcare and pharmaceutical products to bank fees and basic utilities are skyrocketing. This is why the federal government, further stripped of $1.5 trillion over the next decade by the Trump tax cuts, will soon pay more in interest on its debt that it spends on the military, Medicaid, or children's programs combined. Within a decade, more than $900 billion in interest payments will be due annually. Interest on debt is now the fastest growing major government expense. The cost of interest will hit $390 billion next year and that's nearly a 50% increase from 2017, according to the Congressional Budget Office. The global financial system is a ticking time bomb. The question is not if it will explode, but when it will explode. And once it does, the inability of the global speculators to use fabricated money with zero interest to paper over the debacle will trigger massive unemployment, high prices for imports and basic services, and very probably a devaluation of the dollar when it is abandoned as the world's reserve currency. No one knows when this will happen, although the historian Alfred McCoy says the American empire, as we know it, will no longer exist by 2030. This manufactured financial tsunami will transform the United States, already a failed democracy, into an authoritarian police state, awash in weapons and driven by hate. Life will become very cheap, especially for the vulnerable, undocumented workers, Muslims, poor people of color, girls and women, anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist critics who will be branded as agents of a foreign power. 
all will be demonized and persecuted for the collapse. The ruling elites in a desperate bid to cling to their unchecked power and obscene wealth will sanction indiscriminate violence against any group or individual they fear could instigate a revolt. Empires in decay, ravaged by widespread enemy, embrace an almost willful suicide. Blinded by their hubris and unable to face the reality of their diminishing power, they retreat into a fantasy world where hard and unpleasant facts no longer intrude. They replace diplomacy, multilateralism, participatory politics, with a constant mobilization against enemies, real or invented. This self-delusion of late empire saw the United States make the greatest strategic blunder in its history, one that sounded the death knell of the American empire, the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. The architects of the war in the George W. Bush White House and the array of useful idiots in the press and academia who were cheerleaders for it knew very little about the countries being invaded, were stunningly naive about the effects of industrial warfare, and were blindsided by the ferocious blowback. They stated and probably believed that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, although they had no valid evidence to support this claim. They insisted that democracy would be implanted in Baghdad and spread across the Middle East. They assured the public that U.S. troops would be greeted by grateful Iraqis and Afghans as liberators. They promised that the oil revenues would cover the cost of reconstruction. They insisted that the bold and quick military strike, shock and awe, would restore American hegemony in the region and dominance in the world. It did the opposite. Historians of empire call these military fiascos a feature of all late empires. Micro-militarism. The Athenians engaged in micro-militarism when during the Peloponnesian War they invaded Sicily, suffering the loss of 200 ships and thousands of soldiers and triggering revolts throughout the empire. Britain engaged in 1956 in micro-militarism when it attacked Egypt in a dispute over the nationalization of the Suez Canal and then quickly withdrew in humiliation, empowering a string of Arab nationalist leaders such as Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser and dooming British rule over the nation's few remaining colonies. Neither of these empires recovered. Empires, because they rely on the power to dominate and exploit other countries are in fact very fragile. Once this ability to dominate is gone, they unravel swiftly. A year for Portugal, two years for the Soviet Union, eight years for France, 11 years for the Ottoman Empire, 17 for Great Britain, and in all likelihood, 27 years for the United States, counting from the crucial year 2003 when we invaded Iraq. Empires are hollowed out from the inside. Their cities fall into decay. And I just come from the New York subway system. 22-minute <laughs> wait in uh, Penn Station for the next subway. The decline sees the brutality abroad matched by a growing brutality at home. Militarized police gunned down, mostly unarmed, poor people of color, and fill a system of penitentiaries and jails that hold a staggering 25% of the world's prisoners, although we are only 5% of the world's population. The population at home, like the subjugated public population abroad, lives under wholesale surveillance. Public services, including public education, infrastructure, and public transportation become decrepit and dysfunctional. 
This rulelessness, this enemy, is best seen in the strata of our judiciary. There is an aggressive criminalization of the poor, while the ruling elites have virtual immunity. Protected by high-priced lawyers and non-enforcement or rewriting of laws. Amid selective enforcement of laws in the rule-less society. The high rollers on Wall Street and in wealthy enclaves are not prosecuted, for example, for possessing and ingesting illegal drugs, but the poor are thrown into prison and must forfeit all their property for being caught with small amounts of the same drugs. I live in Princeton, New Jersey, and I am sure there are as many drugs and probably of better quality in Princeton than there are in Trenton. But police in Kevlar vests, armed with long-barreled weapons, are not kicking in Princeton doors at two in the morning to terrorize families for a nonviolent drug warrant. HSBC, the world's seventh largest bank by total assets, after admitting to laundering $800 million for Central and South American drug cartels, was slapped with symbolic fines and a deferred prosecution agreement, which is the legal equivalent of a get-out-of-jail-free card. The poor, meanwhile, are hounded, arrested, and fined for absurdly criminalized activities such as not mowing their lawns, loitering, selling loose cigarettes, although Eric Garner was not at the time he was murdered selling loose cigarettes, carrying open containers of alcohol or, this is my favorite, and it's real, obstructing pedestrian traffic, which means standing on a sidewalk. These fines are used to fill state and county budget shortfalls resulting from corporations and the wealthy fixing the rules to avoid paying meaningful taxes, if they pay taxes at all. This virtual tax boycott by the rich, has broken yet another vital social bond. The idea that everyone contributes a significant portion of his or her income to make the society function. The elites who sacrifice nothing for society and are not held accountable for their criminal behavior live in what Matt Taibbi calls a stateless archipelago, or what a writer for the New Yorker called Richistan. They are legally empowered to pillage the nation, amass obscene wealth, and wield unchecked political and legal control. Brent Kavanaugh, aside from most probably being a sexual predator, is, as Ralph Nader has said, a corporation masquerading as a human being. The result has been the obliteration of primary social bonds that, however biased in favor of the white majority, once held the nation together. The shattering of these bonds has left tens of millions of Americans adrift. Society, Durkheim wrote, is no longer sufficiently present for individuals those cast aside can participate in the society, as Durkheim noted, only through sadness. The self-destructive pathologies that plague the United States, opioid addiction, morbid obesity, gambling, suicide, sexual sadism, we are a pornified culture, hate groups, mass shootings, rise out of this enemy. And my new book, America, the Farewell Tour, is an examination of these pathologies and the enemy that fuels these self-destructive behaviors. Durkheim also noted that the poor have lower rates of suicide. Because, as he wrote, the poor know that the rules are rigged against them. 
James Baldwin made much the same point when he wrote that African American men are less prone to a midlife crisis than white men because they are less susceptible to the myth of the American dream. Most African Americans learn very early in life that there are two sets of rules, one for blacks and one for whites. But white Americans, because of white supremacy, are more susceptible to the myth and therefore more infuriated when the myth is exposed as a con. This, I suspect, is why nearly all mass shootings and members of right-wing hate groups, along with a majority of supporters of Donald Trump, are white men. Capitalism, Durkheim wrote, is antithetical to creating and sustaining the relationships that are vital to social bonds. Capitalism rewards those for whom relationships are transactional and temporary. Relationships under capitalism are mercenary. They are part of the scheme for personal self-advancement and require the oily manipulation of others. To advance in a capitalist system, it is necessary to build and then discard a series of ultimately hollow relationships. These empty relationships, and you can see them on display at any business gathering, contribute to the collective enemy and disintegration of social bonds. Capitalism may cater to a natural desire among many for self-enrichment. But you don't want this greed to dominate society. Capitalism rewards single-minded narcissists and often con artists, devoid of empathy and incapable of remorse. It rewards those focused exclusively on personal gain and self-aggrandizement. Once a capitalist class achieves complete control, as it has in the United States, it dismantles the structures that make social bonds possible, seeing in them an impediment to profit. The more concentrated wealth becomes, as with corporate capitalism, the more damage it inflicts on society, sending jobs to overseas sweatshops and leaving American workers underemployed or unemployed. Karl Marx saw alienation as a positive force, one that estranged workers from the means of production and moved them to question the structures of power, educate themselves about their exploitation and revolt. But for Durkheim, this alienation or enemy is debilitating. It is, he wrote, a collective asthenia that drains us of energy and will. It manifests itself in self-loathing. We may indeed understand what is happening around us, Durkheim argued, but we lack the ability to free ourselves from the despair, frustration, and rage that cripple our lives. Our actions require an object outside of themselves, Durkheim wrote. It is not because we need to sustain, to sustain the illusion of some impossible immortality it is because it is implicit in our moral being and cannot be lost even partially without that moral being losing its reason for existence. There is no need to demonstrate that in such a state of collapse, the slightest cause for depression can easily give rise to desperate acts. When life is not worth living, everything becomes a pretext for ridding ourselves of it. For individuals are too closely involved in the life of society for it to be sick without their being affected, Durkheim wrote, its suffering inevitably becomes theirs. Trump is not the product of the leak of the Podesta emails, James Comey, or even racism although he and many who support him are racists. Nor is he the product of Russian bots. Demagogues always arise from failed democracies, plagued by rulelessness, by enemy. 
They tell an enraged population what it wants to hear and crudely to the delight of the betrayed. Ridicule the elites who sold them out. Removing Trump from office without confronting the enemy that defines the lives of tens of millions of Americans would do nothing to restore democracy. In fact, it would probably consolidate the power of a Christianized fascism, rapidly filling Trump's ideological void, which cloaks itself in a cloying piety and false morality. Vice President Mike Pence, because he is a creature of the Christian right, would probably, as Noam Chomsky has pointed out, Noam's just turned 90, I did an event with him two weeks ago in uh, San Francisco, be, would probably be worse than Trump if he gained the presidency. This enemy, as it always does, has empowered demagogues who must be understood as cult leaders rather than traditional politicians. A disempowered population infantilized by a world it cannot control gravitates to cult leaders who appear omnipotent and promise a return to a mythical golden age. The cult leaders vow to crush the forces embodied in demonized groups and individuals which are blamed for their misery. The more outrageous the cult leaders become, the more they flout law and social conventions, the more they gain in popularity. Cult leaders are immune to the norms of established society. This is their appeal. Cult leaders demand a godlike power. Those who follow them grant them this power in the hope that the cult leaders will save them. Trump has transformed the decayed carcass of the Republican Party into a cult. All cults are personality cults. They are extensions of the cult leaders. The cult reflects the leader's prejudices, worldview, personal style, and ideas. Trump did not create the yearning for a cult leader. Huge segments of the population betrayed by the established elites were conditioned for a cult leader. They were desperately looking for someone to rescue them and solve their problems. They found their cult leader in the New York real estate developer and reality television show star. Only when we recognize Trump as a cult leader and many of those who support him as cult followers Will we understand where we are headed and how we must resist? It was 40 years ago, last month, that a messianic preacher named Jim Jones convinced or forced more than 900 of his followers, including roughly 280 children, to die by ingesting a cyanide-laced drink. Trump's refusal to acknowledge and address the impending crisis of ecocide and the massive mismanagement of the economy by the kleptocrats, his bellicosity, his threats against Iran and China, his withdrawal from nuclear arms treaties, along with his demonization of all who impose him, ensure our cultural and if left unchecked, physical extinction. Cult leaders are driven at their core by the death instinct the instinct to annihilate or destroy rather than nurture and create. And Trump shares many of the characteristics of Jones as well as other cult leaders, including the founders of the Heaven's Gate cult, Reverend Sun Young Moon, who led the Unification Church, and David Koresh, who led the Branch Davidian cult in Waco, Texas. Cult leaders are narcissists. They demand obsequious fawning and total obedience. They prize loyalty above competence. They wield absolute control. They do not tolerate criticism. They are amoral and emotionally and physically abusive. To see, they see those around them as objects to be manipulated for their own empowerment, enjoyment, and often sadistic entertainment. All those outside the cult are branded as forces of evil, prompting an epic battle whose natural expression is violence. 
A cult is a mirror of what is inside the cult leader, Margaret Singer wrote in Cults in Our Midst. He has no restraints on him. He can make his fantasies and desires come alive in the world he creates around him. He can lead people to do his bidding. He can make the surrounding world really his world. What most cult leaders achieve is akin to the fantasies of a child at play, creating a world with toys and utensils. In that play world, the child feels omnipotent and creates a realm of his or her own for a few minutes or a few hours. He moves the toy dolls about. They do his bidding. They speak his words back to him. He punishes them any way he wants. He is all powerful and makes his fantasy come alive. When I see the sand tables and the collections of toys some child therapists have in their offices, I think that a cult leader must look about and place people in his created world much as a child creates on the sand table a world that reflects his or her desires and fantasies. The difference is that the cult leader has actual humans doing his bidding as he makes a world around him that springs from inside his own head. George Orwell understood that cult leaders manipulate followers primarily through language, not force. This linguistic manipulation is a gradual process. It is rooted in continual mental chaos and verbal confusion. Lies, conspiracy theories, outlandish ideas, and contradictory statements that defy reality and fact soon paralyze the opposition. The opposition with every attempt to counter this absurdism with the rational, such as the decision by Barack Obama to make his birth certificate public, or by Senator Elizabeth Warren to release the results of her DNA test to prove she has Native American ancestry, only plays to the cult leader. The cult leader does not take his or her statements seriously and often denies ever making them, even when they are documented. Lies and truth do not matter. The language of the cult leader is designed exclusively to appeal to the emotional needs of those in the cult. Hitler kept his enemies in a state of constant confusion and diplomatic upheaval. Joost A.M. Merlu wrote in The Rape of the Mind, The Psychology of Thought Control, Menticide, and Brainwashing. They never knew what this unpredictable madman was going to do next. Hitler was never logical because he knew that that was what he was expected to be. Logic can be met with logic, while illogic cannot. It confuses those who think straight. The big lie and monotonously repeated nonsense have more emotional appeal in a cold war than logic and reason. While the enemy is still searching, for a reasonable counter-argument to the first lie, the totalitarians can assault him with another. Cult leaders engage in the permanent lie. The permanent lie is different from the falsehood and half-truths uttered by politicians such as Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, or Barack Obama. The common political lie these politicians employed was not designed to cancel out reality. It was a form of manipulation. Clinton, when he signed into law the North American Free Trade Agreement, promised, and I'm quoting, NAFTA means jobs, American jobs, and good paying American jobs. George W. Bush justified the invasion of Iraq because Saddam Hussein supposedly possessed weapons of mass destruction. But Clinton does not continue to pretend that NAFTA is beneficial to the working class since reality has proved otherwise. Bush does not pretend that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Once it was clear, none were found. The permanent lie, however, is not circumscribed by reality. It is perpetuated even in the face of overwhelming evidence that discredits it. It is irrational. Those who speak in the language of truth and fact are attacked as liars, traitors, and purveyors of fake news. 
They are banished from the public sphere once totalitarian elites accrue sufficient power. The iron refusal by those who engage in the permanent lie to acknowledge reality, no matter how transparent reality becomes, creates collective psychosis. The result of a consistent and total substitution of lies for factual truth is not that the lie will now be accepted as truth and truth be defamed as a lie, but that the sense by which we take our bearings in the real world and the category of truth versus falsehood is among the mental means to this end is being destroyed, Hannah Arendt wrote in The Origins of Totalitarianism. The permanent lie is the apotheosis of totalitarianism. It no longer matters what is true. It matters only what is correct. And federal courts are being stacked with Federalist Society judges who served the correct ideology of corporatism and the rigid social mores of the Christian right. They hold reality, including science and the rule of law, in contempt. They seek to banish those who live in a reality-based world defined by intellectual and moral autonomy. Consistency is discarded. Complexity, nuance, depth, and profundity are replaced with the simpleton's belief in threats and force. And this is why the Trump administration disdains diplomacy and has dynamited the State Department. Totalitarianism, wrote the novelist and social critic Thomas Mann, is at its core the desire for a simple folktale. Once this folktale replaces reality, morality and ethics are abolished. And as Voltaire reminded us, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. The cult leader grooms followers to speak in the language of hate and violence. The cult leader constantly paints a picture of an existential threat, often invented, such as the caravan, that puts cult followers in danger. The 4,000 immigrants, most from Honduras, in southern Mexico, are in fact nothing new. Caravans of immigrants have been with us for several years. The beleaguered and impoverished asylum seekers, including many families with children, have made that journey from Honduras up through Mexico many times before. But Trump, aided by nearly nonstop coverage by Fox News and Christian broadcasting, used the caravan during the, the elections to terrify his followers. Just as he, along with the same media outlets, portrayed the protesters who flooded the US Capitol to oppose the nomination of Kavanaugh, were portrayed as, as unruly mobs. Trump claims the Democrats want to open the border to these quote unquote criminals and to quote unknown Middle Eastern terrorists. Christian broadcasting, such as Pat Robertson's 700 Club, was splicing pictures of marching jihadists in black uniforms, cradling automatic weapons into video shots of the caravan of migrants. The fear-mongering and rhetoric of hate and violence, as I saw in the former Yugoslavia, eventually leads to acts of violence against those the cult leader defines as the enemy, the 13 explosive devices sent to Trump critics and leaders of the Democratic Party, including Obama, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, George Soros, James Clapper, and CNN. Allegedly by Cesar Sayak, an ex-stripper and fanatic Trump supporter who was living out of his van. Heralds more violence. And Trump tossing gasoline on the flames. Use that assault against most of the leadership of the Democratic Party to attack the press, or as he calls it, the enemy of the people. And it should come as no surprise that another enraged American white male 
his fury and despair, seemingly stoked by the diatribes and conspiracy theories of the far right, entered a Pittsburgh synagogue and massacred eight men and three women as he shouted anti-Semitic abuse. The proliferation of easily accessible, high caliber weapons, coupled with the division of the country into the blessed and the damned by Trump and his fellow cultists, threatens to turn the landscape into one that resembles Mexico, where at least 145 people in politics, including 48 candidates and pre-candidates, along with party leaders and campaign workers, have been assassinated over the last 12 months. Look south if you want a vision of the future. The cult leader, unlike a traditional politician, makes no effort to reach out to his opponents. The cult leader seeks to widen the divisions. The cult leader brands those outside the cult as irredeemable. The cult leader seeks the omnipotence to crush those who do not kneel in adoration. The followers yearning to be protected and empowered by the cult leader seek to give the cult leader unlimited power. Democratic norms and impediment to the leader's omnipotence are ridiculed, attacked, and abolished. Those in the cult seek to be surrounded by the cult leader's magical aura. Reality is sacrificed for fantasy. Those who challenge the fantasies are not considered human. They are satanic. Behavior that ensures the destruction of a public figure's career does not affect a cult leader. It does not matter how many lies uttered by Trump are meticulously documented by the New York Times or the Washington Post. It does not matter that Trump's personal financial interests, as we see in his relationship with the Saudis, takes precedent over the rule of law, diplomatic protocols, and national security. It does not matter that he is credibly charged by numerous women with being a sexual predator, a common characteristic of cult leaders. It does not matter that he paid little or no income taxes and routinely committed financial fraud. It does not matter that he is inept, lazy, and ignorant. The establishment whose credibility has been destroyed because of its complicity in empowering the ruling oligarchy and the corporate state might as well be blowing soap bubbles at Trump. Their vitriol to his followers only justifies the hatred radiating from the cult. The removal of Trump from power would not remove the yearning of tens of millions of Americans, many conditioned by the Christian right for a cult leader. Most of the leaders of the Christian right have built cult followings of their own. These Christian fascists embraced magical thinking, attacked their enemies as agents of Satan, and denounced reality-based science and journalism long before Trump. Cults are a product of social decay, of anomie, and our decay and despair are expanding, soon to explode in another financial crisis. The efforts by the Democratic Party and much of the press, including CNN and the New York Times, to discredit Trump as if our problems are embodied in him alone are futile. The smug self-righteousness of this crusade against Trump only contributes to the national reality television show that has replaced journalism and politics. This crusade attempts to reduce a social, economic, and political crisis to the personality of Trump. It is accompanied by a refusal to confront and name the corporate forces responsible for our failed democracy and growing social inequality. This collusion with the forces of corporate domination neuters the press and Trump's mainstream democratic critics. Our only hope is to organize the overthrow of the corporate state that vomited up Trump. Our democratic institutions, including the legislative bodies, the courts, and the media, 
are hostage to corporate power. They are no longer democratic. We must, like liberation movements of the past, engage in sustained mass civil disobedience and non-cooperation as we are seeing today on the streets of Paris. By turning our ire on the corporate state, we name the true sources of power and abuse. We expose the absurdity of blaming our demise on demonized groups such as undocumented workers, Muslims, African Americans, Latinos, liberals, feminists, gays, and others. We give people an alternative to a democratic party that refuses to confront the corporate forces of oppression and cannot be rehabilitated. We make possible the restoration of an open society. If we fail to embrace this militancy, which alone has the ability to destroy cult leaders, we will continue the march toward tyranny. Thank you. I have a question from the beginning of your book. You make a really strong position, probably towards the end of chapter one, I'm hearing the audio book, that we do not, that you shouldn't go up to white working class people and tell them about multiculturalism and identity politics. You should talk about economic justice first and then social justice. So assuming for the sake of argument you can't get both at the same time, would you explain your position that you should go for economic justice first rather than social justice, as well as explain what specific actions you're asking people to take? As a reporter, the revolutions in Eastern Europe, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Romania, and I saw how when you pull crowds of the size that, I mean, they managed to diminish the size of the crowds this weekend in Paris when they employed, what, 8,000 police or something in the streets of Paris. But when you can, uh, day after day, as was true in East Germany, or was true in Prague, get half a million people shutting down the center of the city. And of course, nonviolence is key. And what has hurt the Paris protests uh, has been both from the far left and the far right. The anarchists in the far right who have carried out property destruction and burnt cars. This is a gift to the state. That didn't happen in Eastern, it didn't happen in East Germany and Czechoslovakia. Did, Romania was a little different, where I also was. So it is sustained, at, it, it's essentially the South African understanding of non-cooperation. Um, it is creating uh, disciplined, peaceful, massive, sustained protests. Uh, and the danger of that, uh, as all of the theorists, and, and what I'm talking about is revolution. But the danger of that, as all of the theorists of revolution have noted, for Crane Brinton, Jeffrey Davies, and others, all of whom say that no revolution succeeds until a significant portion of the ruling apparatus defects, or at least is neutralized, is not willing to defend the regime. And this took place in East Germany in September of 1989 when Eric Honecker, the dictator, sent down an elite paratroop division to Leipzig with orders to fire on the demonstrators. Um, when they got, the paratroopers got there, the uh, city authorities refused to deploy them in the streets. Honecker was out of power within a week. Um, the same was true in Czechoslovakia. Once it was clear that the security forces would not defend the discredited communist elites, um, they were done for. And so that's why nonviolence is key. And you, you just go back through the history of every revolution and they, they have succeeded because uh, uh, because of these defections, which creates paralysis within the mechanisms of ruling power. Um, so I, I write, I was at Standing Rock, I write about Standing Rock, that's a, a very uh, good example, seven months of nonviolent uh, resistance led by a deeply spiritual, and I think that, that spiritual element is important, uh, by uh, Native American leaders and all, there, you know, there were 10,000 people when I was there, about half of them were, were white people, but the Native American elders 
uh, were quite uh, astute about uh, making them sit through long lectures about what they were doing and why and the tactics they would use. So it's rebuilding those mass movements, uh, w which really is our only hope. Um, you've seen flashes of it. You saw it with uh, the teachers' strikes in places like West Virginia. Never forget that they defied their union leadership who wanted to accept the contract. You saw it a few years ago with the teachers' strike in Chicago. Um, but really, that's it. It's, 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 and we ha that, because that's the only, the only way that we're going to succeed is to pit power against power. And the only power we have is that we're a lot more of them than they, than they are. Well, economic justice versus social justice, King wouldn't have made that distinction. King, King was quite clear that there would not be an end to racism until there was economic justice. Uh, and of course, when King crossed over, especially after he denounced the Vietnam War, uh, that white liberal base f fled from him as if he had leprosy because they were willing to accept desegregation in the South. Uh, but, but they weren't willing to, to take the next step, which was, in essence, to, to give to African Americans the reparations they are long overdue. Um, and affirmative action, as Johnson said in his speech at Howard University when he announced it, w was designed as reparations. It's been distorted and, and, and disfigured to be about diversity. It was never about diversity. It was about accepting the fact that white Americans owe African Americans uh, a lot. They built the damn country, first of all. Uh, in the same way that Germany accepted its responsibility for what it had done to the Jews in World War II. We've never done it, historically. So uh, I, I don't make that distinction. I think the fact that uh, the boutique activism of the left has focused on multiculturalism and identity politics to the exclusion of economic justice is why people of color have often have such disdain for the white liberal class. And I saw that in Zuccotti Park. So Zuccotti Park was, uh, which I supported. I mean, I love those kids. But it was largely a middle class, college educated, driven white and for the first time, these were, they were that's what Bakunin called de classe intellectuals, people who expected to be, find a place within the, the elite systems and then found there was no place for them. And this is kind of arcane, but Marx and Bakunin went back and forth. Marx saying, hated de classe intellectuals. Bakunin arguing, I think correctly, that they are vital for any, to fusing any successful revolutionary movement. But you didn't find poor people of color from East New York or there because what those white kids were experiencing, which was uh, underemployment, unemployment, lack of benefits, evictions, are something that had been going on all the, going back uh, several decades into poor communities at, under neoliberalism in particular. Uh, and, and, and we got diverted, I'm talking about white people, and, uh, and got caught up. We, we forgot the primacy of economic justice. So. I, I don't, I think that division has hurt us. And it's something that uh, the great radicals like King understood were intimately linked. Uh, why are not the journalists, publishers defending? Well, I just, I, I am. I mean, as you may know. And I just did a, uh, on Friday night, I did a worldwide, through WikiLeaks, uh, kind of live stream event in his support. Um, why? Um, well, I, let me break down the dividing line between the electronic media, which no longer does journalism, um, and essentially works as a cheerleader for the power elite, and then institutions like the New York Times. It's interesting that the, the, the legal Council for the Times uh, has publicly uh, denounced the calls to extradite Assange, saying quite correctly that it creates a legal precedent. Uh, if you, because remember, Assange didn't 
Assange was leaked the material. He didn't. He didn't. It was, he, Chelsea Manning took it, but you know, or others. We don't know who took the Podesta emails. It doesn't matter. I would have published them if, even if the Russians had given them. My, my, I published stuff from 20 years overseas. I've done the Mossad's bidding, and I've been leaked stuff by the PLO. And you know, if it's true, I'll write it. I mean, I won't write ever a name. I won't, you know, that will get someone killed. But if the information is true, I run it. So, uh, I think the, the so the legal counsel for for the Times has come out and said um, that this is extremely dangerous for the reason that I just mentioned. Um, I'm not at the New York Times anymore. Uh, I, I don't know what they're thinking is. I find it amazingly short-sighted. They printed his material, just as the Guardian did, and and then they just threw this guy under the bus. I know Julian. I. I visit him when I'm in London. So um, I just think he's been effectively, the character assassination has been relentless and effective, and that's what they always do. Uh, remember, that's what they did to King, by the way, especially after 1967, including the New York Times. Go back and read the New York Times report on his April 4th, 1967 speech. Read the editorial. Uh, and it is, it is really vicious in terms of denouncing King. Candlelight Revolution that occurred in South Korea, uh, where millions peacefully demonstrated one candlelight lit another candlelight, and millions of people right. came out day and night, most most dramatically at, at night. Yes, which led, to, which led to the reconciliation. Well, which led to the ouster of the then president, right. who today is in prison for 38 year sentence corruption, among other things. So that was a hugely successful type of revolution that I think uh, more people should should know about. Um, and it is effective, it was effective, and it was peaceful. Yeah, no, it's a very good point, and it, it was. And you know, it's interesting in Leipzig, in East Germany, it also began with candle. Uh, they, would mar they were going through the streets, I think it was every Monday, organized by Lutheran clergy and laughed off at the beginning. But you're right, suddenly, instead of a few dozen Lutherans carrying candles through the streets of Leipzig, it was 70,000 people. Um, and that's what we have to do. And we have to be, and I have been, relentless about attacking Antifa um, and the Black Bloc. And I pay, I pay for it, I just came back from the West Coast, they picket my venues, um, all dressed in black, they're outside, and they all carry a sign which reads exactly the same thing, which is F you Chris Hedges, um, which is kind of, for me, an expression of their political maturity. Um, they are, first of all, half of them are cops, um, and they are a gift in the same way that the far right and the far left has been a gift to Macron and to the French gendarme. And, um, and we can't, we can't, you know, we've got to be, as King understood, we've got to be, make sure that our movement is nonviolent and is disciplined because our power is our moral voice. Um, that is our power. And, and we destroy its credibility even in acts of property destruction. Uh, Chris, you mentioned earlier, um, and I just wanted to thank you for, for showing up and giving a speech. Um, I, your book, America, the Farewell Tour, was my first introduction to your works, and I think it's fantastic. I wish more people my age would, would read books like that instead of, you know, watching Talking Heads on MSNBC or CNN. Um, but one thing that you mentioned earlier really struck out to me, and you said, you know, Donald Trump, you know, kind of filled the rotting corpse that is the Republican Party. Um, but when you look at the state of the Democratic Party as well, there, there's no, in, in my opinion, true sense of, of leadership, and it's just as rotten and corrupt as the, as the GOP. And when you look at capitalism really, you know, kind of being that force behind, like, the, the neoliberalism, you know, movement, and, you know, that kind of speech that you get on networks like, you know, MSNBC or CNN, um, I'd love your thoughts on what you think the current state of the Democratic Party is. Like, is it worth saving? Um, and do you think that, you know, there could be a true progressive movement in the U.S.? Well, I think we have to acknowledge that the Democratic Party does not function as 
a traditional political party. The base has absolutely no say in, uh, in fact, you know, the DNC, the, the, the Democratic National Commission, they're all picked from superdelegates who are all appointed, who are all lobbyists and corporate donors and, you know, former Democratic governors. Um, you can just look at the wide variety of candidates put up in the midterms. There is no ideological consistency to the Democratic Party at all. Um, you have a few figures like uh, um, um, uh, Casio Ortiz and others who have a kind of Bernie Sanders progressivism, um, but we have also watched since the 2016 elections a huge purging of Sanders people uh, in states like California at the, I don't think it's recoverable. Um, because unlike the Labor Party, which was able to carry out a populist coup and put Corbyn in power, uh, although the Blairites, I love Margaret Thatcher was asked what was her greatest achievement, and she once said, Tony Blair. Um, uh, and, and that's, you know, Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, uh, you know, basically the, Clinton transformed the Democratic Party into the Republican Party, and he pushed the Republican Party so far to the right it became insane. Um, the, the failure on the part of the Republican Party is that they, now I'm talking about the old traditional elites like the Bushes and the James Bakers and these kinds of figures, they cater to what Lenin called the useful idiots, the Christian fascists and the nativists. And, uh, um, but as I wrote in American Fascists, eventually the useful idiots take over, which is what's happened. And now, it, I mean, you, you watch the traditional Republican Party establishment just flee. Um, unless they are carrying the banner for Trump, they can't get elected. Uh, in the Democratic Party, it's so diffuse. I mean, it reminds me, the Democratic Party reminds me of the old uh, Social Democrats in Weimar, because in, so in 1928, the Social Democrats under Ebert were polling in the single, I mean, the Nazis were polling in the single digits. Then you had the 1929 crash. Then uh, Ebert and the Social Democrats cater to the international banking system, which bails Weimar out and imposes draconian forms of austerity, uh, including abolishing unemployment insurance. And so the, the spectrum, political spectrum in the United States is the repugnant Snopes-like face of Trump and his supporters, or on the other side, it, it's what, uh, you remember the book Friendly Fascism? So it's all the Princeton graduates and Harvard graduates who work for Goldman Sachs, which is a criminal organization. Um, and, uh, and so it's how do, you want, how do you want it served up? But the problem is neoliberalism, and I, all recommend, I recommend to all of you David Harvey's book, A Brief History of Neoliberalism. It's not long, it's very succinct, it's, it, but it gives you, th this was the ideology cooked up by the oligarchic or the ruling elites. It makes no economic sense. And you don't need to go through Piketty's 600 page book to figure it out. It makes no economic sense. It was used to justify uh, the return of oligarchic power and the concentration of oligarchic wealth. It has as much validity as a, a governing theory as the divine right of kings. Um, so, as long as the Democratic Party maintains fealty to that ruling ideology, which it does, then, and, and of course, the, I don't know how we're going to, you know, I, on the day that Sanders, uh, actually, it was, I think, in this church, the night before the climate march, I was with Bernie. And so Shama Sawant, the Socialist City Councilwoman, and I were pressing Bernie before the event why he wouldn't run as an independent. And Sanders said, well, I don't want to end up like Nader. Well, he's not wrong. The Democratic Party, if he had defied the party, would have destroyed him. Um, but his, his failure was to believe that we were going to build an effective opposition movement within an election cycle or within the confines of the Democratic Party. So uh, the day that he endorsed Clinton, Cornell West and I were marching with several thousand homeless people on the w aptly named Wells Fargo Center. And, um, and I drove home with Cornell, who's one of the most prescient, it's really depressing to have friends that smart. Um, well, I guess it keeps me in place. Um, so, 
we're driving back to Princeton and we're listening to Sanders' endorsement speech and Cornell says he missed his historical moment, meaning he should have walked out. And, and he did. And now what is he? I mean, you know, when he went, so his crowds, which could, you know, 10,000 plus, once he started campaigning on, on behalf of Clinton, he was lucky to get 100 people. Thank you for your speech. However, I see you contradicting yourself. You started out very strongly with the critic, critique of capitalism domestically and internationally. But at the end of your speech, as a response to Sanders, you spoke about that democracy uh, democratizing or weakening the corporate system. You are still leaving us with capitalism. There is no change. We're still faced with these people. They are very powerful. The great, the New Deal, which Roosevelt started 30, 40, 50 years ago, is being smashed by these capitalists. You also haven't pointed out that these cap, that in my opinion, these capitalists are not going to sit on their hands and allow this democratization to continue. Well, that that I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take up too much of our money. So what are you suggesting? Because you're leaving us with capitalism. Well, I'm not. Uh, I mean, I'm a socialist and, you know, I've long declared... So advocating socialism. I am advocating... Yeah, I am advocating socialism. Um, and that's all in the book. But, I mean, there's a limit to, you know, you can't... People were probably nodding off. It's probably too long as it was. So I, you can only go... You have to be kind of focused, you know, in a talk like this. Uh, but I'm quite clear at the end of the book that uh, we're not going to save ourselves from climate change alone unless we reconf radically reconfigure our relationship to each other and to the earth on which we depend for life. Some friends were asking uh, me the other day about some of the questions around um, debt and uh, servicing the debt and the, the proportion of the budget that that's going to take and things like that. And they were essentially asking why it's not bigger news. And why isn't that the front page above the fold story every day? And I said that um, if we were to acknowledge the problem, we would have to then admit that we don't have a solution to it. Is that a simple enough answer? Well, first, you're not going to hear it on uh, media outlets that are owned by Comcast or CNN, which pulled in a billion dollars last year, m most money it's ever made. Um, it was on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I'll come another day and critique the New York Times, and I have many critiques, and as some of you know, I was pushed out of the paper uh, for denouncing uh, Bush's call to invade Iraq. I'd been the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times. I knew very well, like all Arabists, what was gonna happen. Um, but the New York Times, while an elitist publication, and it is geared, they have a number, the 30 million Americans who are either among the elite or managers of the elite. That is their target. That, that's the number they use. It nevertheless still does journalism. So that story was front page at the Times. The power, when I worked for the paper, the power of the paper was not what it printed, but that it set the agenda for other news organizations. So when I was overseas, all of these talking heads you saw on the networks would come to my hotel room in the evening and say, what did you write for tomorrow? Because that's what we have to go out and do. That was the power of the paper. That's now gone, as the electronic media has, is all info entertainment. I mean, that's, th this Russia stuff, I have no doubt that Russia tried to influence the elections, um, but if you really want the country that has effectively influenced and interfered in our elections, it's Israel. We don't, it's unmentioned. And watch, go on the website Electronic Intifada and watch that Al Jazeera series. Uh, where they sent an undercover reporter inside the Israel lobby. Israel managed to get it blocked from ever being broadcast on Al Jazeera, and it's been leaked now to a website in France, and I don't know if they'll keep it up, but watch it. Um, but there's not a mention, not a word. I mean, we just had a long article on the front page of the New York Times today about Saudi, how the Saudis, I mean, 
any, I worked overseas, every country seeks to influence political events in a foreign country to their own interests. So that were the Russians sending out Facebook pay, yeah, probably. But it, that, that, that gives the Democratic Party an, an exit from having to confront the social inequality, the rupturing of social bonds that's created our mess. So I think what you're raising is the impoverishment of journalism. However, uh, you know, addicted to kind of uh, the sensational TV news was when I began, it still did journalism. Remember, we had foreign bureaus, they're all gone. We had reporters and producers and camera people and they went out and they produced a three to five minute segment. That's all vanished. Um, so the Times did understand that it was important, but it didn't echo or resonate within the wider society because of the destruction of journalism. I think many of us believe that Trump is not really the problem, which is symptomatic of the failure of the Democratic Party in weeks. But for a little uh, historical perspective, uh, you know, many of us, frankly, um, the change, and he certainly had the opportunity to change, or to start to change. But why, why do you suppose uh, that never occurred? I mean, he was an outsider. I don't think he was headed to the A-Rates. Well, it's a good question. Um, when uh, Obama announced his candidacy, Dennis Kucinich printed out Obama's voting record in the Senate and gave it to me and said, you better read this because it's every corporate giveaway a senator can embrace and he supports the death penalty. And then Kucinich said, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of smoke. I mean, Obama was a creature of the Chicago political machine, which is the dirtiest political machine. I mean, Albany's a close second. But the dirtiest political machine in the country. And, uh, and I know Jerry Wright very well. And, uh, I mean, as Jerry said, as he watched Obama rise within that system, there was not a position he would not willingly discard if it was any impediment to his advancement as a politician. So, uh, Obama did what he did because uh, he was always, he had been selected by the elites who understood that there was a crisis, I mean, the bankers were terrified, and they know that, knew that by putting forward a black candidate, who Cornel West called a black mascot for Wall Street, um, they would be saved. Uh, and they were. Um, and I think it's important to remember those who control systems of public information are very adept at, through focus groups and polling and everything else, under, feeding back to us what we want to hear. There's a line, I can't remember one of the books I read about how Clinton was so, the pollsters loved him because they could tell him the results of the polls and then he would go out the door and repeat it almost word for word. Um, and, and so that, that is the kind of tragedy of Obama because he did come in with a mandate. And and he squandered it, and he's now becoming, like the Clintons, very wealthy because of it. But he sold us out. I mean, I have a real problem with him on the use of, misuse of the Espionage Act to shut down whistleblowers because it directly affects my, what was my job, which was journalism. In reading your works for a number of years, I'm a um, lowly paid um, CUNY adjunct professor. Um, but non nonetheless, um, I've been following all of your work and um, truth is, um, the young lady who just won Congress in this area, I think, um, how do you pronounce her name? Right. right, she and a group of um, young progressives um, were at a recent Harvard University sponsored every two year, um, some type of congressional sponsorship and where she protested. And she said that her people didn't send her to Congress to uh, basically get in bed with the bankers. And you mentioned Goldman Sachs. And the former 
president of Goldman Sachs stated to her and these young progressives that you don't understand how this game works. And when I read it, I took it as like a threat that, you know, they're saying you're not going to be here long, whether it's congressionally, or you're not going to be here long, whether it's your life. And so um, I want to know if you're familiar with what just happened at Harvard <coughs> University as it regards these um, young progressives who were just elected into the Democratic Party. I hadn't heard that, but it's not surprising because within the American political system, it is impossible to vote against the interests of Goldman Sachs. You can't. And just take a look at the senior Goldman Sachs executives who populate every single administration, whether it's the Bush administration, the Obama administration, or the Trump administration. The, this is where power lies, in the hands of a global corporate oligarchy, which is supranational has no loyalty to the nation at all. Um, and Ralph, that's why Ralph Nader calls them traitors. And, um, and that threat uh, is real, and they have the money and the mechanisms and the political connections and the ability to disseminate false information uh, to take down anyone within the political system who defies them, and they will. Picking up on the idea of the Velvet Revolution in South Korea, candlelight, uh, what about what Reverend Barber has been doing starting with the Moral Mondays in North Carolina, and then he and Reverend C.L. Harris have been trying to do. I live in New York City. I don't know what's happening in the rest of the country, but I'm sure you have been traveling throughout. Do you have? hope for what he's trying to do. Yeah, I think what they're doing is great. Um, it hasn't created the kind of contagion that we need. On the other hand, um, you know, I, I talk about the Velvet Revolution, which I covered. So I was in the Magic Lantern Theater in Prague every night with Václav Havel and Dinsbier and Klaus. And, and the power of a figure like Havel, it was interesting because he wasn't very charismatic. He wasn't even a very good speaker kind of mumbled. But in from 1977, uh, when he started Charter 77, this human rights thing that made him a non-person within the Czech state, and he was in and out of prison, and uh, he, the only way you could hear Václav Havel's voice was on Voice of America. He wasn't, you couldn't hear it through any Czech medium. He just was so like Jeremy Corbyn, consistent and had so much integrity that when the Velvet Revolution took place, there was no question because they knew, I think like Corbyn, that Havel would never sell them out. And, um, and so, talking about Barber, it was from 1977 to 1989. That's a long period of time. Uh, and I, I've told this story, and some of you may have heard it, but, you know, in Prague that winter, uh, you, you suddenly had an eruption, a nonviolent eruption, and we were pulling 500,000 people nightly in Vensela Square in the snow. And you saw how all of these amazing dissidents, and I had a particular affinity to the Velvet Revolution because it was all run by artists and writers and poets and musicians, and um, so the, there had been a young Charles University student, Jan Pollock, who, to protest the 1968 Soviet invasion to overthrow Dubček, had gone to Vensela Square, lit himself on fire, died four days later from his burns. Uh, that was a non-event in state media. It was never covered. Uh, his funeral procession was broken up. When his grave became a shrine, his remains were exhumed, cremated, the ashes were given to his mother and she was told she was not allowed to rebury them. So that winter of 89, his poster was everywhere in Prague. And two weeks after the communist government was overthrown and uh, 10,000 Czechs marched to Red Army Square and renamed it Jan Pollock Square. I was also in Vensela Square when Marta Kubasheva, one of the most famous singers in Yugoslavia, she had sung the anthem of defiance against the Soviet invasion was called a prayer for Marta. When Dubček 
was gone and the pro-Soviet regime was installed, uh, her entire recording stock was destroyed. She was banned from the airwaves. So from 68 to 89, she spent the intervening years working on an assembly line in a toy factory. And I was with 500,000 checks in that square and watched her walk out on the balcony and begin to sing a prayer for Marta. And every check in the crowd knew every word. That is the moral power of resistance. People hear it. Solzhenitsyn writes about this. And the Gulag Archipelago, which is an amazing work, and, it, and I don't buy the abridged. Um, anyone read David uh, uh, Levering's book on W.E. Du Bois? Yeah, right. It's, it's like that, but it's worth it. I once told James Cohn that I'd gotten the abridged. He goes, you are not reading, you are re you're not reading the abridged. You got to read what every word that he wrote. Um, <laughs> And it's the same with the social needs. And so, you know, that's our job. And for me, that's, that's what, you know, I come out of a faith tradition. And that's what faith is. I asked Daniel Berrigan once, you know, how do you define faith? And he said, the belief that the good draws to it the good. Even if empirically everything around you says otherwise. And I think that's right. I've seen it. Um, and we don't see it. We don't see that effect. Um, and it's our job to draw the good to the good and then trust that it goes somewhere, even if everything around us seems to say that it's going nowhere. Um, and, and I think that in moments of extremity, and we certainly are in one, it, it's only faith that's going to save us. It's not the practical. It's what uh, Reinhold Niebuhr calls sublime madness. Um, and, and that's why I look at, at resistance. I mean, if you really want to strip it down to its core, I look at the forces that now control the earth and control our lives as forces of death. And that it's incumbent upon those of us, especially those of us who come out of a faith community, to stand up and fight for the forces of life. Um, and, you know, it's at the risk of using a line I've used before, I don't fight fascists because I'll win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. I didn't hear men in the background. Do you expect the war in the Middle East? In other words, it would be that external demand would be next phase of uh, Demand historically completely destroying the Middle East because there's not that many people, countries left that they still have the government in place. Well, you have Pompeo, Giuliani, Bolton. These are figures who are wedded to Israel and to Saudi Arabia, and they all want war with Iran. Why? Um, because they've lost the war in Afghanistan. They have turned huge swaths of the Middle East into failed states. And they need someone to blame. And they're blaming Iran. It doesn't make any sense because, uh, I don't know if you're from the Middle East or you know. Okay, so you know. Okay, there you go, from Iran. So you know that the Iranians hate the Taliban even more than the United States. In fact, there is a lot of uh, cooperation with Iran in the war against the Taliban. And meanwhile, the country that we fund, Pakistan, uh, is the great supporter of the Taliban. In fact, they, because we funneled uh, all of the aid during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan through the ISI, they starved the Taliban because all Pakistan thinks about is India. And they know that with a Taliban regime, that will be hostile to Delhi, which is their sole geopolitical or their most important geopolitical priority. So uh, then you, the only reason we're 14, what are we, 16 years? How many years? It's 16 years of war. Uh, it's not good for anyone in the Middle East. It's not good for us. It's not, but it's very good for Raytheon, Halliburton, Northrop Grumman. And, you know, when they fired those cruise missiles at Libya, when there's another disaster, thank you, Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, every one of those cruise missiles is $1.1 million. So uh, I, I can't remember who makes the cruise. I think it's Northrop Grumman. 
I mean, just in a span of like two days, uh, that was half a billion dollars worth of cruise missiles that had to be reordered. So I think that at this point, the only, at least from that I can see, the only driving factor behind this perpetual war and expanding the war is the profit. Now, Israel has a, a motive because they want to see these countries turned into failed states. It's why the Israel lobby was pushing so hard for us to go into Iraq. Um, but for us, it's just catastrophic. But it gets back to that micro-militarism where it's self-devouring, self-destroying, um, and it's all around us. I mean, even in this city, our infrastructure is collapsing. Uh, the, the whole the you know destruction of all of those institutions and mechanisms by which we sustain a civil society are being destroyed for what? To feed uh, the US military, which now swallows half of all discretionary spending is beyond being audited. You know, we spend more money on military bans than we do on the State Department. I mean, this is nuts. And if you read the end of the Roman Empire, you see essentially a one million man Roman legion that goes beyond control, with the end being that the Roman, the Praetorian guards are auctioning, literally auctioning off the, the role of emperor. Um, and that is why the U.S. military is internally the most dangerous force to democracy in the United States. Do you expect a war? I, those people want a war, and Trump is malleable. Um, I mean, as you know, it would be catastrophic. Iran is not Afghanistan. That's 80 million people in Iran. Um, and, as you also know, if you attack Iran, it will be interpreted throughout the region as a war on Shiism. 60% of Iraq is Shia, Bahraini Shia, 3 million Shiites in Saudi Arabia, most of whom live in the oil fields. Yeah, so I think that if we see Kelly gone, which we will, and Mattis gone. Mattis, those are the two checks on war with Iran. And if Kelly and Mattis are replaced by people of a similar ideological fanaticism, like Bolton or Pompeo, then, yeah, I'd be very frightened. Um, I was wondering, um, if I may ask, um, in terms of former Iranian empires, um, and their critics and figures uh, who, who, who served to be their critics. Um, are there any that with, with, with whom you yourself might identify um, as critic of empire, of this former empire? Sure. Uh, I read not too long ago uh, a very obscure German novel written in 1937 by the uh, Joseph Roth's lover, um, and I'm going to draw a blank on her name. Ro so by 1937, Roth, who, I don't know if you know Joseph Roth's work, but he certainly understood the danger of the decay within Europe, uh, like Freud, uh, um, and like Thomas Mann and others. And he's completely silenced now. He's blacklisted. He ends up uh, drinking himself to death in 1940 in Paris after being stripped of his German citizenship. And it's a kind of moving, uh, largely autobiographical study of um, artists and Jews and communists and intellectuals trying to maintain some kind of semblance of normality with the rise of fascism. But by that time, Roth is completely silenced. And he said, you know, I feel as if I was a mouse squeaking against an avalanche, but squeak, I must. Um, that's kind of how I feel. Um, I, of course, studied classics at Harvard um, and am well aware of Cicero and Cicero's warnings about investing your intellectual and emotional life in the arena. And, I mean, Cicero was a conservative, you know, but... Um, a conservative with a conscience. And in the end, he's hunted down by Mark Antony, who, who's Shakespeare's kind of revived as a good guy. And he's beheaded, and his hands are cut off, and his severed head and his hands are taken to the arena, uh, and it's announced that he will never speak or write again, and 40,000 Romans cheer. 
Um, those are the figures I connect with. Chris, thank you so much.